In the reptile hobby, there are definitely some things that are very frowned upon by experienced keepers. So today, let's go over the top five practices that are really looked down upon in the reptile hobby. My name is Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. I think what I'll do for this video is go over the pros and cons for each of these five things. They're just five practices that are looked down upon. And we'll start off with one that actually I can't have any pros for, I can't really defend. Number five, heat rocks and no thermostats on your heating elements. And what I mean by that is, if you have say, well, first of all, let's just get it over with, heat rocks, like these heat rocks that you'll see at like a PetSmart, Petco, whatever, and are often sold as good for your bearded dragon, leopard gecko, whatever, are terrible. I mean, I would never ever stick, say, my African fat tail in an enclosure with one of these things. They get overheat really easily. I mean, I guess you could put them on a thermostat, but even then, they're inside the enclosure, so there is always a risk of fire, of maybe the animal biting it, scratching it, the cord, right? Because the cord and the element is actually inside the enclosure, and the animal's gonna be on top of it, which is very different than something like a radiant heat panel, which, they're amazing. Those are great. I use radiant heat panels and all of these things behind me. The difference is an animal's not going to be resting on these things and a radiant heat panel as advertised, the ones that I use from Reptile Basics via Dino Reptiles, they're guaranteed not to burn your animal. They don't get hot enough to the touch to burn your, they get pretty hot, but not hot enough to burn you. I can stick my hand on there at full bore, but they're always hooked up to a thermostat and that's the big thing. And I've talked about this before. Never ever don't have a thermostat on a heat mat, heat tape, radiant heat panel, whatever. And some people will even say on bulbs. I don't always think you should, but it's not a bad thing at all to have a thermostat on a bulb. And if you're looking for a thermostat, a good one that you can trust that is really cost effective, uh, there's a link below. It's an Amazon affiliate link. So yeah, I make a couple cents if you buy one, but those are the ones that I use. And this is the only one on the list. There's no like pros for that I can think of. There is no pro for using a heat rock that may burn your animal. And there's definitely no pro for not using a thermostat. Thermostats are like 30 bucks. Just buy one. You have to buy it one time. They almost never malfunction. And if they do, it's 30 bucks to buy another one. And just to give you an idea, I've got what, five, six, seven, eight enclosures here that have thermostats that I've never ever had to replace. And then I've got racks too. I've never had to replace a the thermostat. No, one has never ever failed me. And heat rocks, like, just there's no reason ever use, they're useless. They're completely and utterly useless. Sing us a song or something, do a trick, and useless. They're dangerous and I do not recommend them at all. Number four, improper substrate. And the reason I say improper substrate, I was gonna call it loose substrate, but I think by now we all know that loose substrate isn't inherently dangerous or bad for most reptiles. Now don't get me wrong, a loose substrate isn't always right in all situations for all species, but the people who tout loose substrate is always bad and if you keep your bearded dragon or your leopard gecko on loose substrate, you're a monster. Those people are so far out to lunch, they don't even know what year it is, I'm guessing. They haven't looked at a care guide since the 1980s book that they received from the library when they were a child. This has been debunked. Loose substrate, in a lot of cases, is perfect for a lot of animals. Diamond here is on a substrate mixture of soil, play sand, which is very important to use the right type of sand if you ever use it, and a dry coconut core product. So I have all those things together. It's dry, it's not wet. And if it does get wet, it doesn't clump together. That's the important thing because impaction is what people are afraid of. And if you use an aggregate that is made for say construction, which is meant to compact together, a very different angular shape rather than a, uh, a round granular shape uh, in the sand, then it can impact. So use proper substrate and you're okay. The other thing I wanna comment on is say, I don't know, ball pythons on aspen. I don't recommend this. There are certain substrates that are bad for animals, or not perfect for some animals. And something like a ball python, which needs a more humid environment than an aspen would be able to give them without molding, isn't proper. Now, if you're doing this, no worries. Change it out. Coconut core or coconut blocks or whatever are actually pretty cheap. So you can do that. And in fact, this guy right here, me, I was guilty of this. I did keep ball pythons 
on Aspen for a very short amount of time when I first got them and clearly didn't do enough research, but I corrected this mistake immediately. And that's the important thing. If you're doing something wrong, you see something on this list that you're doing that maybe you shouldn't be, do more research because maybe I'm wrong. But if you find that what you're doing is wrong, just correct it immediately. That's all we can ever ask of anybody. And there are some absolutes for the most part, something that you'd buy for like a guinea pig or a hedgehog or something like that, a hamster, like a cedar or a pine. Most of the time, the oils that are secreted in these types of wood shaving will give your animal at least some irritation, if not respiratory irritation, which might end up to be an infection. And anyway, it's just bad. Your animal might get sick. So instead, an aspen would be better for something like, I don't know, a hognose snake, for example. My hognose snakes, I keep almost all of them on aspen. I have used dry coconut corn in the past. That's worked well for me. The thing with aspen is if you have a, an animal that needs a higher humidity level, it's going to mold before that humidity level is reached. Aspen is gonna mold, I don't know exactly what precise humidity level, but if you get in over 50%, there's a chance it's gonna start to mold. Mold is always bad for your animal's respiratory system and uh, their skin, I would imagine as well, their scales. So it's just bad all the way around. And that's why I didn't say loose substrate. I think by now we all kind of know that works, but improper substrate is something you might wanna think about and just do a little bit of extra research of what loose substrate or you know carpet, whatever tile, is best and that's the other thing too about about carpet carpet i used to really tout for things like bearded dragons but now i don't and in fact leopard geckos i don't think should be on carpet either though the carpet that you buy that's actually made for reptiles and here's why i woke up and went downstairs one day when i had a very much smaller collection and i went down and cheech my oldest reptile that i have in my entire collection uh there is blood all over his enclosure. He was alive and he's fine. He's still with us. This was like five or six years ago, maybe, uh, or maybe even longer. He ripped one of his nails out because it got stuck in the fibers of the carpet, which is sold for leopard geckos. So that's why I don't recommend it. And I know that there's gonna be a million comments. Well, I've used carpet for 25 years and it's never been an issue. And you're right, it'll probably never be an issue. But also, there are better options out there. If you don't wanna use something that is loose, you could always use paper towel, newspaper, slate, whatever. I just don't recommend these because what happened to me could happen to you. And before we get to number three, if you don't mind, smash the subscribe button. No cost to you really helps this channel out. And Diamond was whispering in my ear there that he wants you to do it. Okay, let's move on. Number three, keeping animals in tubs and grow tents. Now there's a million other things as well that people will frown upon. I don't know. A lot of the times people will say, don't use stock tanks, whatever. There are certain animals that do well in certain enclosures, and there most animals can do well in a number of enclosures, but there are limitations, especially with tubs. And the reason I threw a grow tents in there is because recently it's been a topic of conversation. In my personal opinion, to get it out of the way, I don't think there's anything wrong inherently with tubs or with grow tents. In fact, I think some people do really amazing things with both. And I'm not getting paid to say this, Snake Discovery, everyone knows this channel. That is the gold standard, in my opinion, for tubs. Absolutely. And there are people who do it wrong. And if you want to watch, I did a whole video last week right here about if tubs are good or they are bad. But some people, and even in the comments last week, they were just so dead against tubs. And I think it's because maybe those people haven't seen the proper way, or maybe they just have their mind made up and they're not willing to change it. That happens a lot of the time too with some people. But I think that there are really good reasons to use tubs and there's bad reasons too, like they save space and they're cheaper because I'm just gonna put a paper towel in there and a water bowl and that's it. That's not the right way to do it. You have to offer enrichment. So anyway, I did the whole video. You can watch that more for tubs. Grow tents is, the reason I brought this up is because some people really don't like them and I'm not one of those people. And if you wanna watch a whole video about grow tents and someone who's really put a lot of thought into it, my buddy John and Professor Herp, amazing channel. I'll link his video right here. Did a whole video about it. I think it came out yesterday. But anyway, my opinion is they can be set up well, very well and very elaborately and beautifully. But I personally don't use them. I might in the future, but I have no plans to as of right now for a few reasons. They're a little bit more difficult to set up because if you just get, say, one of the cheaper grow tents especially, they're made of a, like a, a pliable material that for certain animals they might be able to get out of pretty darn easily. Now this isn't for everybody. And what a lot of people do is they'll use like a bamboo or something like that around as a barrier so they can't scratch their way out. Now there are certain animals, like arboreal animals, if you wanted to put a bunch of anoles in a, a grow tent, an arboreal grow tent, something that stands up vertical, 
great. If you wanna put a full grown, I don't know, a full grown tegu into a cheap grow tent that isn't reinforced, you're not gonna have a grow tent and your tegu is gonna be somewhere where you didn't leave it last. So there are limitations with it, but I just think my main point and the main takeaway is it's a lot more work to set it up than a PVC in my opinion. That's just what I think, but I don't have any experience with them. And the reason I don't is because I choose to use PVCs instead. I just personally, for me, like them better. And if you're looking for the very best PVC that you can buy, period, without a doubt, Cages Custom Enclosures. There's a link in the description below. It went together easy. That is honestly the most ridiculously easy setup and the most beautiful setup that I have. And the construction of it, it's not heavy, but it's still not flimsy at all. It is the most robust enclosure that I own code WWR if you want to hit the link in the description and the, the code gives you free door handles. So just to wrap that one up, there's nothing wrong with tubs. There's nothing wrong with tents. You just got to do it right. Number two, rehoming and trading reptiles like they're playing cards. Now, obviously there's reasons why this is bad. I don't recommend using animals solely as a way to make money. If that is your main goal with getting into reptiles, don't. Most of us, don't make enough money to feed our families or do this full time. Most people, it takes so much work and so much dedication and so much time in order to do that. And even then, a lot of the time it's just not feasible for most people. So that's number one. And a lot of people use their animals as kind of like trading cards, like they trade them back and forth. And there's nothing really inherently wrong with this if you're doing it because let's suppose that you get yourself a corn snake. And you don't really like corn snakes. And you're giving it a, a good home, by the way. There's no like neglect here. And somebody's getting rid of their king snake because king snakes aren't for them. And they want to try a corn snake. And you've never had a king snake, but they seem really interesting to you because you've done a ton of research. Does this seem oddly specific? Exactly. Because I used to have a corn snake and now I have a king snake. And it was a straight trade. And the reason I did that is because I didn't really like keeping the corn snake. It wasn't really for me. It wasn't a super handleable animal. And the person that wanted the corn snake had a breeding program that that corn snake fit into perfectly. And with me, I just like the king snake better. And it's a handleable animal. This is Big Lou and we'll do a video on him very soon. Hit subscribe again. It, we'll do a video on him soon. Now I will say that rehoming reptiles is not like rehoming dogs most of the time because most reptiles, not all, but most, don't give a care who is feeding them and who is ch changing their enclosure. They don't care who is cleaning up their poops and who is giving them food. They don't care. They don't form a bond where if I were to give away one of my dogs, they would sit there and stare at the window and stare at the door until I came home. They'd be devastated. If I gave Diamond away, he would not care. He wants to bite my ear and that is what I am good for to him and I'm providing him warmth right now. That is it. In fact, I got Diamond earlier in the summer. There was no breaking in period. He, I was his dad immediately. There was no issues whatsoever. He attached onto me just like he would have the guy that I got him from. And if I got rid of him, which I won't because I freaking love Diamond, but if I did, he wouldn't care. Most animals don't. There are certain ones that maybe can form somewhat of a bond with you, but rehoming is not bad if you can't take care of the animal. You should not feel bad. If you feel like I'm bored of this animal, I'm not gonna give it the best life and someone can give it a better life, rehome it immediately as fast as you can to the best home you can possibly provide. But if you're just kind of rehoming and then, oh, I kind of like it again, you get another one. No, I don't like it. And like, just make up your mind. That's not cool either to, to kind of like treat it like a toy. They're not toys. They're animals, they're living beings. And number one, and the most likely to chap somebody's behind, cohabbing. Now, I've done a whole video about this. You can watch it right here. And cohabbing, in my opinion, isn't always wrong, but it is certainly not always right. And this is what I mean by that. Some animals can be cohabbed and do better in cohab situations, like garter snakes. Some reptiles, you definitely should not cohab, like king snakes or hognose snakes because king snakes are known to eat other snakes. That's why they're called king snakes. Where say something like a leopard gecko is on the fence. Some people say never ever and some people say under the right circumstances. That's me. I'm one of those guys. I only have one cohabitation, or actually I have two. No, I have three. Three cohabitation kind of things going on and this is what they are. I've got two turtles. They do really well together. They're absolutely fantastic. They've never shown any sign of aggression and mostly 
that's okay to do turtles as long as you have a big enough enclosure. I've got two toads together. Again, no aggression issues whatsoever. And I've got two leopard geckos together. And this is where I get a little bit of guff. I think that as long as they are of the same age, they are the same sex, which is female always, never cohabitate full-time a male and a female, and never ever put two males together, because if you go to bed with two males together, you'll be waking up with one of them on the side of the tub and you'll be getting them off with a hose, some assembly required. Don't recommend it. But in my situation, there were clutch mates that came out of the same tray in the eggs at the same time, the same day, they always lived together forever. I've observed them, a lot. Well, they used to be in my office, actually, and in a setup, in a 40-gallon uh, setup. So when I was watching them, always, I would feed them in separate bowls. They would both just eat out of one bowl together and then go to eat out of the other bowl together. They have two water dishes. I've never seen either of them drink standing water ever. They have multiple hides to this day. They've never shown any aggression whatsoever. They're not fighting for hot spots because they've got multiple. So observe is the main thing. Again, I go right into it with a cohab video. So there you go. Those are the top five. What do you think? Did I miss something? I got this idea actually into the comment section. Actually, no, I didn't. I got it from the Discord server, which is free, by the way. Thank you guys. We're at a thousand members now. I have so much fun talking to you guys. It's a free thing. If you just want to chat with me and other uh, reptile lovers, it is like my favorite place to hang out. And a giant thank you, as always, to our friends at Cages. We throw, showed you the link in the description below. And because Diamond will be going into his cage's enclosure, you might be thinking, well, I've got that set up. What do I feed my bearded dragon in his new cage's enclosure? Grub Terra. That's my suggestion. As part of a well-balanced diet, I feel like this is a breakfast commercial. Grub Terra, black soldier fly larva, all the animals I've ever fed these to, I even started feeding them to the turtles, and they just gobble them up. Very nutritious. There is definitely a spot in your diet, not your diet, in your bearded dragon's diet, or whatever you have, leopard geckos, African fat tails, whatever, for Grub Terra. <laughs>